All right, so today I'm going to make an application with you related to developing flawed fragilities. Okay, so to develop flawed fragilities, what do you guys think based, I, I believe I talk lots of time about developing fragilities. If I have a building and I need to develop a flawed fragility for a building, where should I start? What do you guys think based on our conversation over the last two months? How can I start developing flawed fragility? Do you guys have any idea? We talked about it a lot. What we were looking at in Fulcron for flood um, the height of the flood. How, how should we start to develop flood fragility? Yeah, it's all about the flood heights. So first we need to look at the flood heights, right? How these flood heights impact the building? So we need to divide the building into components. So we need to be, yeah. So we need, when we say a flood fragility, each component in this room has different resistance. This one and this one. So when we say building fragility function or building vulnerability functions, so we need to look at the vulnerability of the components, and then we have, need to have a rule to say that this building fragility is like this. If this component is damaged and this component is damaged, so the entire building performance will be this way. So we need to look first at the components. And with components, some people will look at, like most of the wind people when they look at the components, wind impacts the envelope. So people who develop in flood fragility, they look at what components, what do you think? They look at the windows, the doors, the walls, the roof. Most of the flood fragilities in the literature, they only looking at this. I never see somebody look at the flood fragilities for uh, like uh, a refrigerator inside a building or the drywall inside the building. So you only look at the envelope, okay? For earthquake guys, when they look at the flood fragility, they look at the lateral load resisting system. What is, because this is how the earthquake caused damage. So what is the resistance of the lateral load resisting system? Like the framing action between the beam column joint or the shear wall system or the combined shear wall with the frame action. So this is the things that we look at when we deal with earthquake. But when we deal with flooding, flooding impacts everything, impacts the structure, impacts the interior content, impacts everything. So the first thing is, is to identify what component that you have in your building and what is the exposure of these components to flood damage. So to do this, we need to start with a building, okay? And we call this building archetype. So we call this building an archetype. So, because every archetype is different. You can pick a hospital. The hospital will be completely different if you are picking a residential building or you are picking a school. So you need to start with a model. This is similar to what you have happened in your research. Like when you do research for your PhD, you, you pick like, you, you say that I'm gonna do research on residential building. And then you start to build a residential building and put it in the wall of wind and then test it. This is completely different if you will do your research on a school or hospital, right? So we need to pick an archetype. And what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna pick a residential archetype and take you through the steps on how to develop flood fragility for this archetype. You can do this for your research. Like I did this for 15 archetypes and it take me about 18 months to develop flood fragilities for these 15 archetypes. And it didn't happen like we developed an approach and then we thought that this approach is not the best. Then we started to adjust our approach to get to the best one because it's a research. Nothing is like it's perfect 100%. Everyone has come up with better idea that can reflect what is exactly happened to the building. All right, so let's see how can we develop flood fragility for a two-story residential building on a crowd space foundation. Do you guys, does any of you don't know what is building on a crowd space foundation? Because maybe when I came to the US, I don't know what is the crowd space foundation is. Does any of you don't know, like me, when I came? <laughs> All right. All right, so most of the, uh, the foundations for the residential buildings here in the US, they are like, let's say this is a building, something like this. They are on a slab of grade. Basically, you level the grade and then, okay, I'm, 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 I'm just like explaining this to you, right? So does any of you doesn't know it? <laughs> I don't know. You, don't know. you know it? No. All right. So this the slab on grid is basically that you level the ground and you make a slab. 
because the foundation like in Egypt or other countries is completely different. Like we do footings, uh, strip footings, combined footings, something like this. Let's have a yeah, because we do reinforce the concrete building, but here's a wood building, like a very lightweight building. So basically you do a slab, just a reinforced concrete slab, and then you start to build on this slab. That's it. Without any, without any footings, without anything. So what's it called? Maybe. Called space foundation. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it like let's finish. This is a slab of grade, something like this. Slab. The second one is a crown space foundation. It's basically something like this, but it's elevated from the ground. So basically, the, you have like some columns, wood columns, and this wood columns has like a very small footings. Like you have. Column like this, column like that. And then you will have a floor beams from wood cross. So it's all floor beams from wood and also this columns from wood. And it has like a very small footings. Maybe it's not reinforced, just like concrete. And then just to make this concrete column stick to the ground. It is not reinforced. It's just like you will have to dig a hole, maybe 0.5 meter. And then you bore some concrete around this. And then you will have your foundation. This part, this area is called crawl space. This is space, it's called the crawl space that you can go and crawl in. So it's called crawl space foundation. And then you have your building something like this. This crawl space is around like two to four foot. Some, so basically this is preferred type of building where there's flood. So when the flood happened, this building is elevated from the ground. Most of the building in Florida are slab on great foundation, but that's what I see. I really see when I drive in a neighborhood that has this type of foundation. However, in the areas that has frequent flooding, it's better to have uh, a crawl space foundation. The uh, elevated foundation is something like this, but this height is like 10 foot. So you have like your building here, something like this, and then you have your column, something like this, something like this. So this is elevated. So this is slab grade, foundation, and this is crowd space. Um, those columns are reinforced or not? No, it's, it's not, there's no reinforced concrete. All this is what? Wood piles. Yeah, right. and this is elevated foundation or pile foundation. Pile foundation. And also the pile is wood. All right, so our uh, model today is um, our two story building on a crowd space foundation. So what I did to develop a flood fragility for this model, I have to invent the model, try to see what is the typical two-story building in the US and try to make it up. So I built this model in Rivet and I added all the components. It's a four bedroom house. And it has like, let's let's go through it because you will have to start with components. So you will have to make realistic assumption about these components. So let's see what is, inside this building. So let's go to do section box and see what is inside this building. All right, so this is the first story. It has a garage, so I had to include the components in the garage and it's actually on lower elevation from the main house. So I have here's the crowd space. It's like one meter, but the garage is in the level of the ground. And then I have a living room, I have TVs, I have kitchen cabinets, I have fridge appliances, uh, furniture, uh, and also I have a laundry room, washer, dryer, all these components need to be included. Kitchen cabinet, laundry cabinet, lots of components. So in the crowd space, you surround the building with the wall? Uh, what do you mean? This, this I, I meant like, this is like, looks like a concrete beam, but it's not, usually it's, it's all wood. It's all what? I mean, I mean uh, this should be piles and- Biles, yes. Right. Like so columns, like there is columns. Like if, if you decide that you have column inside your building, maybe you have column here, maybe you, this is the architecture, not yeah. the structure. Yeah. Okay, so you have columns at specific places and this columns goes to the ground. 
but your building is elevated. Like there is a floor beams at a specific level that you start. Yeah, I mean, I mean that the crawl space is like surrounded from the outside of the wall. Yeah, it can be surrounded or you can have it open. There are some people that leave it on, but definitely if you if you kept it open, things will go inside. Usually people do, they close it and they put the ducts and all the things related to the HVAC, the mechanical, and they put the AC down there. Down. But this is not a preferred practice because when flood happens, all these will be flooded. So usually people are recommended to have all the duct works and all the, in, uh, the mechanical things on the attic, like here you know, or here. The heater, the AC. And the structural wall and the structural columns, they go until the ground, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's- Because I was thinking about how that structural- It's a, it's a just wood. Like if you guys take a wood class- and, part, But the columns that are structural- wood Yeah, it goes, goes the, from all the way down until, until- the ground. Yes, exactly. All right, so this is this is the first story, and let's go to the second story. And most of the bedrooms it will be in the second story. Like we have four bedrooms, something like this. You have like a living here, so I have a bunch of beds and also the components in the bathrooms and the bedrooms and everything. So I have to make up a model so that I can start with. Once I made this model, Rivet help you to quantify. The, the quantities, like, like if we put a drywall, if I mark a drywall and ask Rivet, what is the quantity? How much is the surface area of all the drywalls in the building? It tells you what is the drywall surface area? And what is the, the exterior walls surface area? How many doors I have? How many windows I have? Because finally, I will categorize these components by component type, because I, what I'm interested in is the component type, not where, and also where is this component? Like if this door in the first story, it's completely different from the second story because it's on a higher elevation. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna count all the doors and windows and I have a component called doors. And like if I have five doors or two doors in the first story, I'm gonna put two doors. They are at the same height and the price of this component is this and the resistance of this component is that same thing with the drywalls like i divide the drywalls uh, but for drywalls and um, and for walls the things that it goes vertically so when i do damage analysis so we have when we do damage assessment for the entire building we assume that if you will have to replace drywalls up to here this is a damage state but if you will have to replace the whole story Drywalls, so you are then in the next damage state. So if your drywalls is getting is getting wet until here, you usually drywalls when they got wet, you need to go two feet above the wet area, and then you cut and then you replace. So let's say that the water is here, so you cannot cut here. You need to go a little bit up because the water maybe goes inside, so it can cause mold. So you go up maybe one or two foot, and then you cut and then you start replace the dry wall. So we had some limitation, like the things that are vertically like, okay, if you have this one foot is wet and you decided to replace the whole wall, that's that's actually, it's not cost effectively, right? It's not cost effective. So you will have maybe to cut to the middle and then replace the middle. So that's what we did with the things that is vertical, like drywalls, exterior walls, exterior wall sheathing, all this stuff that has a vertical lens, we divided them into pieces. Uh, all right, so let's see how the components of this building look like. So I had an Excel sheet. I developed it based on the components here. And let's check. All right, let me get here. Yeah, so this is the Excel sheet with all the components inside the building. So I have the crawl space, space insulation, the garage, everything in the garage, drywall, insulation, because when I say this wall, this wall has drywall, and also there is insulation behind it, and also what is it, and also the painting. All these are components at the same thickness. So if we take a section in this wall, we will find many things behind it. So I put them in the same category. When we say drywall, so we say the drywall, insulation, and painting on the drywall. Okay, so, and there is a garage cabinet. It says a component by itself. Uh, flooring insulation, like this flooring, it has insulation down there. Uh, also the garage uh, electrical uh, outlets, if you have electrical outlet like this. 
and also the garage walls insulation. Like if you have insulation behind the uh, the walls. So we have all these in one group, and I will tell you about the groups in a few. Then we have the next group of components, which is the HVAC pipes. Assuming that the HVAC pipes, pipes is down below the crowd space, or it's not up there. So we have HVAC pipes, garage drywalls. Look at here. So I have the garage drywalls in two. I have garage drywalls here and garage drywall. So I have it repeated. And that's the thing that I was talking to. I divided the, the walls into pieces. Some pieces, if you have a damage, like very few damage, so it will be in damage state zero. But if you have this damage go beyond a certain level, so you will go to the drywall in damage state one. Basically, I have a wall, I divided it into half. This half will go to damage state one, the second half will go to the damage state one. So not all the drywall are in the same damage state. Okay. Then I have uh, the AC unit, the heating unit, the wood flooring, like this flooring, the baseboard. This is called baseboard. This kind of stuff, sometimes it gets expensive. This is a cheap one, but there is wood one baseboard that is um, expensive. And we have a carpet. All these components are grouped to be in damage state one. So I have here, uh, let's put this up there. These components are grouped to be in damage state zero. So if all these components got damaged, you will be in damage state zero. So damage state zero exceeded. That means damage state zero means a slight damage. Since there is no water inside the building. So all the water is just outside or even went to the garage because the garage is on a lower elevation. It's called the slight damage. So the next level is to go to the image of state one. When you have your HVAC pipes or AC unit, heating units, all these got damaged. And because usually the AC unit is outside, the, heat, the AC itself is outside, rested on the ground on a lower elevation. It's got damaged. Maybe sometimes it's elevated by one or two feet. Some people actually elevate by, by like four foot from the ground. So I have the AC unit, heating unit, wood flooring, like if I have a flooring here and it get wet or a carpet get wet. So basically, this is called damage state one when you have, uh, actually the first one is called the insignificant damage. Damage state one is called the slide damage. So we have insignificant damage and slide damage. Slide damage when you have one inch or two inch of water inside your house, like you have the water, and you can ride this water within the day. Like within a few hours, you try to push the water outside, try to put, block the water from the doors, from the windows. Uh, it will not reach the wind, maybe the doors or something. So, but you still have damage. Maybe the carpet will not dry or will smell, so you will have to replace it. So this is called a slide damage. Let's get to the next level of flooding. So the next level of flooding, when you have maybe one or two feet of flooding inside your home, like the water go up and then goes inside like here. So damage is there too. When the water goes inside with one or two feet, you will have your appliances damaged. Like the refrigerator might went out, stove, washer, dryer, water heater, speakers, if you have dishwasher, uh, all the furniture, like sofa, couches, kitchen tables, and chairs. If you have a study desk, TVs, like if you have a TV mount or something, a kitchen lower cabinet, because the, the kitchen have a lower cabinet, an upper cabinet, all these will get damaged. Bathrooms, uh, lower cabinet, uh, laundry room cabinet, interior doors, internal insulation for the wall, painting, electrical outlets, plus all the components that might get damaged from one or two feet of water. Okay, so we get to a moderate damage state if these components are damaged. So unless some of uh, these components. So uh, the next one. If the water like start to be like three or four foot, like the water is here, maybe like three or four foot, something like here, we are talking about like one and a half meter. So you start to have something getting damaged. So if you have like a range hood for your stove, so the water got here, might get damaged. Uh, our cabinet in your, in your kitchen might get damaged. Uh, uh, your kitchen countertop, your computers, laptop, printer, uh, uh, mixers, all the gadget, microwave, uh, things in the bathroom. So the things in the bathroom, like the uh, like the bathroom thing, and the like, uh, or like, or the um, 
the bathtub or all this stuff, it can get wet. It will not be damaged. But at some point, maybe like the water replaced them. So we assume if the water uh, reaches a certain level, we can we can make assumption that they are total loss. So we will have to replace them. But if the water is like didn't get on the top of them was a very high depth. So we say, okay, we like the water is like one foot or something. So didn't get inside. So you can salvage this. But at this level of flooding, like we're talking about two meter, you might be need to replace them. But with high uncertainty, like you can replace them or you can keep them. So we will see. Yeah, and then I listed things like that are non-structural components like drywalls. And also you will see external wall sheathing, the sheathing outside from the home, exterior cladding and break walls if you have them, the wood trims, the light fixtures, the uh, barking bats, the barking bats is the concrete bats. Maybe they will be floated from the ground. So they might, they might lose soil underneath them. So it, it needs to be replaced. So as you can imagine, we included almost everything, but this is a still damage in state three, not four. This is called extensive damage. Let's get to the next level. So let's assume that you're building. So the next level is you're building a submerged this one. Like the water reaches like four meter or five meters. So it's completely not submerged, but four meters is like very high depth. So we are talking about 12 feet of water. So let's say if your building is soaked in water, like it's in water, so you can say, okay, it will be soaked and then the water will dry out and then we can rebuild it. But when it's soaked with water, like you can say that the building structural components like columns, uh, foundation, you can say, okay, get wet and then get dry. And then we remove everything out and we keep the structure and rebuild. That's what FEMA hazard model is based. Like FEMA said, whatever level of flooding that you have, you will never get to the 100% losses because you can salvage the structure itself after it get dry. But we assume in our model, you can assume whatever you want. We assume in our model, if the buildings reach a specific flood height, like it's south the water, this building cannot be solved. We will consider it as a total loss. And then we will consider that the component, these components are damaged, okay? So this is the same thing here. Like if you have a stairs uh, or let's um, go here, uh, wood framing, ceiling, uh, crowd space, a slab and grade foundation, uh, the flooring beams, the joists, the plywood, uh, subflooring, all the structural components, even the roof stru uh, structure and non-structural component, like the roof membrane, sheathing, insulation, all these, if the water reaches to the roof, so that means that we are in damage state four, okay? So that's how I did it. You can do it in some, like, in, in a way different than this, but this is how I envisioned that, how I develop flood fragilities for flood. Okay, so I listed the components. The next step is, what is the vulnerability of these components to have damage? When we say, when should we say that this component is damaged or cannot work again? How can we say that? So basically when you think about it, it will be very subjective. Like, okay, who can judge that a fridge will work or not after flooding? So we can, what I did here, I assumed if the water reached a certain level, for example, if we are talking about machine like a fridge, there is a main component in the fridge, like the compressor. If the water reaches to the way that the, at where, at the, the compressor at, so it will fail and you need to replace it. So the same thing with the TV. If the water reaches like to the screen, if, if it's like, let's assume theoretically, if it's the, the TV has a base and this base is elevated by like four inches or something. If the water is still at the base, didn't reach to the TV itself, the TV can work again. But if it's reached to the body of the TV, so it will not work. Same thing with every component. But there is still uncertainties, like fridges has models. That each model has the compressor at different elevation. Here, when we add the uncertainties, we assume something. And actually, this is something is widely assumed in our field. Like some people, when they develop fragilities, they know the average, but the mean is something subjective. Uh, sorry, the standard division is something, something subjective. So when we develop fragilities, when the concept of fragility starts with less data, some people start to make up things. Okay, from the best engineering judgment, I believe this is the mean, and we can assume this level of standard deviation. I saw papers, like uh, even like papers they are studying the wind fragilities for like um, a power plant. 
So they assume a certain mean and a certain standard deviation, and this is the best engineering practice. That's what we did here, but we didn't do it for the entire building. We take them component, this is the most accurate way. We take them component by component and assume uh, best in, best, based on our best engineering judgment, an upper and lower bound, where's our components can be damaged there. Like if the flood depth is in between 0.1 meter, 0.5 meter, this component is gonna be damaged. And that makes sense. Like for example, uh, if I have for this unit, the people have here, their A, C unit, something like this. It's posted something like, like that. And it's elevated maybe one feet from the ground. And some people can have it just on the, all these are in the same level right? at the ground level. Something like this. And some people have a bose, and actually I saw it in the field, and they have their AC unit, something like this. All right. So there is a variety of things that we can think of of the elevation of the AC unit. So what we need is the AC unit cannot be under the ground, right? Nobody will dig, and then we will dig a hole and put the AC unit in. So we have zero as a start, right? But the up, we assume something. How about we put one meter as an upper bound? So we start with zero, and then we have an upper bound, like maybe 1.5 meter as a maximum. So we have zero meter and 1.5 meter. The thing is we can make a low, like if you take the mean of these, what is the mean? 0.75, so it will be something here, 0.75. If you develop a normal distribution and assume this as a point, uh, like assume that this is the mean, you can have a distribution something like this and something like this. And this is the mean. I believe when we develop the, um, the standard deviation, so right now we know the mean, we don't know the standard deviation. We use the, a rule, it's called the rule of thumb. But when we, you don't have a mean, but you have an upper and uh, upper and lower bound, there's a rule that we can use to give the average standard deviation for this sample based on the area from here and here, okay? So, but the thing here, when we do a normal, low normal distribution, it will give us some probabilities that the AC unit at a negative value, but it's low probabilities. So we do what is called truncated normal distribution. So the truncated normal distribution is to truncate this part and truncate this part, okay? So we truncated this normal distribution here and here because there is low possibility or maybe impossible that our AC unit will be here and it's impossible that it will be at the height of 10 or 100 meter because you will find it's infinity. This is goes to infinity. And then we can generate the truncated normal distribution. The area under this distribution need to be one. So when we truncate these parts, the area will not be one. So we will end up with having another distribution that is something like this to cover this two areas. So it will be shifted up a little bit. So this is called the truncated normal distribution, but it will not be that big, like because this area is very, very small. So we'll end up with having like, this will represent 99% or 98%. So you can neglect the truncated part if you want to use the whole distribution. But but this is what I, what I did. We did this with every component. Like for example, a TV, a TV can be on a table like 0.6 meter from the ground or could be elevated from the ground at 1.6 meter. So we have to elevate. Also, it's impossible that somebody will have his TV on the ground, like watching the TV from the couch and having the TV on the ground. So it never will, it needs to be a little bit elevated, something that makes sense from the ground. So it will be needed in the IBIT. We did this with every component, sheet, the chairs, furniture, appliances, uh, uh, everything in the building. So here you will find that I have the minimum, all right, let me go a little bit here. The minimum and the maximum level that each component can be. And this is negative because I consider this elevation is zero and anything below is negative. So any components below the first floor elevation will take a negative value. And I have the minimum and maximum elevation of each component based on best engineering judgment. 
And then I have the mean, which is this plus this over two. And I have a standard deviation, which is this minus this over four. This is called rule of thumb. So there is there is actually some like theory behind it. It's not a theory. It's called rule of thumb. Like if you don't have an idea about the. 95%. The, exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of something that we use when we don't have an idea about the standard deviation based on the area of the distribution. All right. So, and here we have a standard deviation. Yeah. So it's basically uh, like if you click here, it's basically D2, like the maximum minus the minimum over four. So we have the maximum of the component. Let's talk about the AC unit. The maximum is 1.5 meter. The minimum is zero, right? If you need to get the mean, the mean is D max plus D min over two. So it will be 0.75. The standard deviation will be D max minus D minimum over four. So you will have 1.5 minus zero over four. It should be 0.3 something. Right? So this is the standard deviation if we don't have an idea. But there is no way to get this standard deviation. You need to actually to get it actually, you need to visit many buildings that has been flooded, collect the information about the appliances that they have, like the AC unit. Some of them will be elevated, some will not will not be elevated. So you will collect the information about these units and then take their mean, like you will have a hundred hundred data about this, and then take their mean and standard deviation. That's it. But we don't have this data. That's why we use the rule of thumb. And I have a description about why did I assume that? Like it started with the level, uh, with the garage elevation. So I have some this a little bit of a description about the assumptions. Same thing we did with the duration. Like um, for each one of these components, I assumed a, an upper and lower bound of the flood duration that this components can be damaged in. Some components will be damaged once as they get touched with water, like electronics appliances. So you will have zero something like this, but like, let's assume that we put a splash of water on your microwave. It might not get damaged, it might get damaged, right? So that's why we added a little bit of uncertainty and the flood duration damage of the components. So we'll find that we have zero, and also we put a maximum number of hours to be soaked in water as one. So the, the mean will be 0.5 and there will be a standard deviation. okay? We did this for all the components. We'll find that the word components has a, a long number of hours, you'll find like 24 hours for garage cabinets that they can be soak the water and you can make them survive if, if they got dry. So we got some uh, information about everything and their duration. Is there one the maximum one hour mean? I mean like if this component is soaked in water for one hour, this is the maximum that can be, after one hour it will be damaged. It will be, it will be a total loss. So between zero and one, so this is, like it can be 0.5 hour, it can be 30 minutes, 20 minutes, something like this. So this is the maximum time. Uh, the maximum time. Understand. After that, it will be a total loss. Okay, so that's what we did with all the components. You can make this actually not one, you can make it 0.2 or 0.1. So this is what we assume. Then we did the same thing with the losses. Like, let's go here. Uh, we uh, have a unit price for each component. So, and also we did it the same thing, upper and lower bound for the replacement cost. Like some people will have a very cheap fridge, like $300, and some people will have a $1,000 fridge or $2,000 fridge. So we have an upper and lower bound for everything. Like for example, the refrigerator, we have 450 as a unit price for the fridge and 3,000 as an upper or a maximum price for the fridge. Same thing for every component. Why we did this? Because we don't want to assume a number. So we, we don't want to like to say that the average is this number. We, we started with, this is the upper and lower limit, and let's take the average and let's get a standard deviation. And let's see how we are gonna use this information. Why I'm doing this, why I'm, why I'm trying to get an upper and lower bound, because I need a mean and standard deviation, because I use the mean and standard deviation to generate 1,000 sample 
of the resistance of each component, 1000 sample of the flood depths that this component can be damaged at. Okay, so I um, want to get this mean and center division and use them in my MATLAB code to generate the sample. Like, for example, if I knew these, I know that the mean here is 0.75 and 0.3, I will give MATLAB these two numbers. The mean and center division and ask MATLAB, MATLAB generate 1000 elevation of the AC units. So MATLAB actually will give you an elevation of 1.5, 1.49, 1.43. And when you get the histogram of all this data, it will be a normal distribution. All right, so let's see what is the, the last thing about this uh, sheet. So here I put a minimum and maximum unit price. What if my component is not one unit? It has multiple unit. Like when I get a unit price for a drywall, it gives me the unit price of the one, foot, one square foot of the drywall. So I want to calculate what is the total square foot of the drywalls in the various floor. So I want to get what is the total. So I have here a field that gives me a maximum unit price, a minimum, maximum, uh, and then mean and center division. And here is the number of units. What is the number of units of the base insulation? So it's in a square foot or something. Uh, what is the drywall? So I have 560 square foot of drywall. And then I multiply the unit price by the total square foot. It gives me what is the total price of all the drywall in my building? What is, if you have two fridge, so you multiply two by the price of one fridge, it gives you what is the total price of the fridge. Because here I only have one component, say it's refrigerated, but maybe you have two. So you put two so that, so the damage will be the same. Both will be damaged, but the price will be multiplied by two. Okay, and then what I did next is, I have the mean and the standard division of the replacement cost of each component. So what I did, I take the mean and the standard division of the replacement cost of the entire damage state. How? I take the summation of the mean of all the components here, and I put it here. And I take the mean of the damage state cumulated. So I will tell you about the cumulated one. Let's, let's look at the absolute. So this is the absolute. And then I have a standard deviation of the replacement cost of the damage state. And I will tell you how I want to use the mean replacement cost of the entire damage state. So basically, if you have five components in a damage state, you have the price of each component, sum all of them, sum all the means, you will get the total mean of the uh, replacement, uh, the total mean of the replacement cost of the component. All right, so this is an overall idea about the component. Let's see how we will use this data to develop fragilities. So uh, I'm not gonna share this MATLAB code with you, but you will see it in the video, record the video, and then you will type it text by text. Well, here, I saw my MATLAB code by reading this Excel sheet, the one that I showed to you that has all the data about the components. So I'm reading this Excel sheet. The next thing is, is to extract data in this Excel sheet. So the first thing that I'm doing here, I'm naming my the data in the sheet A, and the, the very thing I'm, I'm, I'm writing here, assuming normal distribution for the components failure depths below the various floor elevation. So what I'm doing is I'm assuming um, normal distribution for all the components. You can assume that this distribution is log normal and it makes sense. So what I did here, I made a normal distribution and I take the absolute so that I can get rid of the negative value. You can do log normal distribution and you don't have to do absolute because the log normal distribution only generate positive value because there is no log for a negative value. So you can do this and you can do that. What I did, I made a normal distribution and ask MATLAB to generate random variables, sorry, to generate an elevation to this AC unit. But I end up was giving and having an AC unit at elevation of negative three but there is no elevation for negative three. So what I did, I asked MATLAB, take the absolute of negative three, so we put it positive three. So it's the same thing, right? I can set bounds for the generation. You can set bounds, but sometimes like, um, uh, what I did here, I didn't set bound. I used the entire then, because the bounds is like, it's very, very, it caused a problem with the shapes of the fragility, because the things that make your fragility smooth, 
is that you have a very tail, you have tails. This tails make your fragility something like this. But if you take it truncated, it makes your fragilities steep, like it just go sharp, something like this. So it's kind of like mathematical thing. But anyway, I will show you how to fit them. So I can use a truncated and then I fit them into log normal so they, they get a shape. So here we didn't use a truncated. No, I just used the normal uh, log normal and then take the absolute. absolute. Yeah, so here I'm asking, so when I load this Excel file, it's it has A, so actually you can open the data here and see what you have in this uh, Excel file. So here's all the data. You will find uh, cells named as NAN. NAN means it doesn't have number, it has text. So if you go here, you will find that the second field in our Excel sheet, it has text. So this, you have numbers and then you have text. And then, uh, okay, let's... Go back here. Yeah, I have number, text, and then numbers, and then text. So if I go to MATLAB code again, I'll have NAN and then numbers, and then another NAN. Where is the number? Yeah, here. So number seven. So what I'm interested in right now is the mean and the standard deviation of the damaging depths of the components. And this is here. These two, one, two, three, four, five. So they are at column five and column six. So here my MATLAB code, the mean depths normal is at column five and this, the standard deviation is at column six. So I knew where's the mean and the standard deviation. Um, actually I separated the components. Plus one. Oh yeah, here I'm reading the replacement cost of the components. I called this mu RC replacement cost normal. And these cells, are here. Minimum, maximum, mean, standard division. So this is the mean and standard division, these two columns. And I'm getting them here, column number 20 and 21. Then the next thing is something related to developing fragilities. So to develop fragilities, you need to test the resistance of your component at each flood depth, like at 0, 0.1, 0 0.2, Y. Because I need to build this curve, like flood depths, and then probability. That will be something like this. You need to know the probability of failure at one meter, at two meter, three meter, but actually you need to know at 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. .1, so you have a very smooth curve that you can connect your point at. So what I'm doing here, I'm generating flood depths um, from zero to 10 meter with, with intervals of 0 0.01 meter. And I'm gonna test each component, what is the failure probability at 0 0.01, 0 0.02 until I go to 10 meter. All right, so the next thing is uh, the number of the depth steps. It's the length of this vector. And I have the number of components, which is the length of the, of the vector A. So I have here, if I go down, I have 94 components. I can get them from the Excel sheet, but I just want to make this code be applied to any other archetype. So I make them just, I insert the Excel sheet, he go to the sheet and read what is the length of the components. So because I have other buildings that have only 64 components. So basically we'll go to the sheet and find the lens. It will be actually 95 components and the number of simulations. How many Monte Carlo simulation that you want to uh, check? So, so the number of simulation is this component has a mean. Okay, let's take this mean. Mu is 0.75 meter and sigma is 0.3 meter. So Monte Carlo simulations needs how many samples do you want me to generate? So basically, I will give these two numbers to a MATLAB code to do a Monte Carlo simulation and sample from these two numbers. So we'll generate samples. It asks you about what is the number of samples that you want. I want 1,000 samples. You can ask for 100 samples. So basically, it will generate a vector, and it has a numbers. This numbers is using this distribution, 
And when you plot these numbers, it will give you a normal distribution. I will show you in a minute. So, so this is actually what is Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation, you simulate the resistance of, of the components. Uh, the second thing, how many damage states that you have? I have five damage states. And I will leave this for now. And let's go. I will tell you in a moment. What is this? This is a test component. Like I want, because I can't show all the results for the 94 components. I just will pick one component and show you how this component simulations look like of resistance. So the second thing is I'm trying to start the failure analysis to know how many simulation failed each of flood deaths. So basically this numbers is gonna give me after the Monte Carlo simulation, a vector of the flood depths of the component. Vector having a 1000 from one, two until 1000. This will say that the elevation of the AC at 0 0.6, 0 0.42, 0 0.71, 0 0.61, it will give you lots of elevations. And at each of flood depths for, Depths equal to, let's assume one meter. I will check if flood depths one meter, this fail, 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 all of them fail. So the probability of failure is 100, but it will fail. But what if the depth is 0.4? This will not fail. This will not fail, will not fail, will not fail. Until, and then we count the number of failures. And then we divide the number of failures by the total number of simulations. This will give you the probability of failure of the component at just this depth. And then you put a point. You do the same thing at depths equal to, uh, for example, 0.2. And then you get a point, a point, a point, a point from the probability of failure. And then you draw your curve. So basically, that's what we are going to do here. For each component, I'm making a for loop. And I'm asking for each component, calculate two things. The first thing is the replacement cost. And the second thing, the second thing is the failure depths. So let's let's start with the failure depths. So I'm asking MATLAB to develop for each component, the 95 components that I have, a vector of 1000 simulation. So rather than doing it component by component, I use for loop to do all the components one at a time. So this two dots means like over the entire number of the simulations, like the 1000 simulations for each component, I want you to generate a random numbers using this simulation. So in, to start the Monte Carlo simulation, we use this, nor rand. Nor rand means from a normal distribution, pick a random variable, okay? Pick a random variable, and how, what is the number of the random variables based on the number of simula simulations that I decided? So I have a 1000, so it will generate non random variables. The number of them is a 1000 based on the mean and standard division that I have. So I put here the mean depths and the standard division of the depths and the number of simulations. So basically, the Monte Carlo simulation MATLAB that's non rand, it takes the mean, the standard division, and the number of simulation, death three, and it will generate 1,000 random variables that follow the normal distribution. And, she, and this will be done for all the components. Like I have 95 components, so it will be 95. So rather than having one vector, we will have one, two, three, until 90. Five. The first vector is the first component. Second vector, the second component, third component, all the components. Each one has a 1,000 random variable. And we will do the same thing with the replacement cost. So the replacement cost, basically, we will take the mean replacement cost of the component. Let's talk about the AC unit. This one, for example, the mean replacement cost is 3,000. And the standard division is like 500. So basically, you will take the 1,000, the mean, the mean and the 500 and the number of simulation thousand and it gives you that this the replacement cost of the AC unit could be 250 uh, sorry 2500 2700 uh, 3000 because it could be more than 3000 because this is just the mean so it can be 3500 3200 will generate lots of numbers 
So here I'm done with generating random numbers of my simulation. So this is basically like rather than going to the field and collecting 1000 elevation of the AC unit, this was what this simulation did for us. Rather than going to the field and going to 1000 home and collect the elevation of each 1000 home, I'm telling my lab, this is the mean, this is the standard division, generate me 1000 value of the elevation of the component. Same thing, rather than going to the homeowners, how much did you spend on your AC unit? It will tell me I spent 2,500, I spent 2,700. So what I will do, I ask MATLAB, here's the mean and here's the standard deviation. Generate me 1,000 value of the replacement cost of the component. And basically it is just one line. Home rent, mean, standard, de the standard deviation, and the number of simulation. And when you are done with this, let us let me show you if we plot the histogram of this. So let's go to figure number one. Actually, take me like 30 minutes to an hour to run the entire code. So I write before I come here. So I take one component. Do you guys remember component number 58? You can make any component actually. And then I ask MATLAB, develop a histogram on the <laughs> this component. So I have actually the, the sum of all of these components is 1,000. The average elevation is four meter. The average uh, damaging depth is four meter, but actually there is less, like it can go down until 2.5 meter. If you if you want to do this with the replacement cost of the component, you can do this as well. Like if you want to replace the, uh, the failure depths with the cost, so we can change this, control C, and let's put this control V. And rather than rerunning the whole code, let's separate this and let's rerun this. Let's go to figure one. Yeah, here, right now, what I'm presenting is the distribution of the replacement cost of the component. So the average replacement cost was like around 4,000, but it can go as less as 1,000 or can go as maximum as 8,000. Right, so this is kind of histogram of the value of the component, and actually, each each one of these is when you group the number. Like you group them, you can actually decrease these groups. Like um, we can make this a hundred. Run this section, something like this. You can make them a thousand, and actually gives you what is the exact value of each component. Like you see how it looks like. And uh, let's make a thousand. Let's see what will happen. I never made it a thousand. And let's rerun this section. Yeah, so this is how the replacement cost of the 1,000 components look like. Like you have a component with one uh, has a value, just one that has a value of 1,000. You have two has value of 2,000, one that has 3,000. But here you have the maximum is like around 5,000. Okay, so each line of these represent one value for one component. So basically we simulate the process rather than going to the field and collect data, and then we generate the data here. You can do actually this with, uh, if you are investigating the impact of wind on roof sheathing, if you have the mean and the standard deviation of the of the resistance of this sheathing, you can generate this as well. But usually it's um, it also the load has some uncertainty because the load, the wind speed, we use it certain, but when you convert this wind speed to pressure, there's lots of factors. So we use some uncertainties. Let's focus on flooding, but just like giving you an idea that the same process was any fragility developing. Okay, so the next step is, is to identify what is what is the failure of each component at each of flood depths? So what I did, I need you to focus on this nested for loop because it's a very like inside each other. Let's see. So what I want to do, I want to develop a matrix that tell me at each at each simulation corresponding to each of flood depths corresponding to each component. If this component was exposed to this flood depths, is it fails or not? So, so for example, so let's let's focus on this. So we have, I have 95 components, right? So the number of components is 95. And I have 
1,000 depths I'm testing because I have from zero to 10 and I'm testing each 0 0.01. So I have 1,000 flood depths of value and I have 1,000 simulation. Can you imagine? I need to go through all of this. So, and I want to know for component number one, for flood depths number one, for simulation number one, did it fail or not? And then for component number one, for flood depths number one, for simulation number two, did it fail or not? And keep repeating this 1,000 times. And then once I'm finished with the 1,000, I count the number of failures, divide the number of failures by the total number of simulation, getting the probability of failure. This probability of failure is the failure for a specific component at a specific flood depth. Once I'm done with the 1,000 simulation, I need to repeat the same thing for the same component for a different flood depths until I finish all the 1,000 flood depths that I have for the component. Once I finish them, I go to the second component. Can you imagine? Does anybody doesn't pull up? I can repeat it. Okay, so right now we are testing three things. We have 95 components and we are testing the resistance of these components at 1,000 flood depths from zero to 10. So we are going 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.02 until so it's 1,000 step. And the third thing, we have 1,000 simulation, like at each of flood depths, let's assume that flood depths is one meter. You have 1,000 value of the resistance of the component. So you need to see which one of them survived and which one of them fail at this flood depth for this specific components. But how, uh, at each flood depth, you have 1,000 simulation. Yeah, yeah, you have 1,000 simulation for the resistance of the component. For each component? Uh, you have 1,000 resistance. We don't, know, we don't know the resistance of this. Uh, or, or basically the resistance means the, the elevation. So we don't know the elevation of this, okay? So we have 1,000 value. And right now we made the depths deterministic. Like we assume that the flood depth is 0.1 meter. Let's just see, 0.1 meter, how many failures we will have for this? Let's assume that we have 10. So we divide 10 by 1,000. So you have 1% failure probability at 0.1 meter. Then you need to move to the next steps, 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0 0.13, until you finish all the dipses from zero to 10. Once you finish them, move to the next component. So that's what the this nested loop is doing. So basically I said for I equal one to N simulation, for J from one to N flood dipses, for K from one to N components. So moving simulations, you can actually move components, uh, depths, simulation, you can do whatever you want, but I moved simulation, depths, component. And then it check if the flood depths is more than the, the simulation that we have. So the flood depths DJ, because I'm, I'm testing J is the depths. If the depths is greater than the, then the resistance depths of the component, what will happen? Does it fail or succeed? Yeah. If the flood depths is more than the resistance, it will fail. So I put one, put number one. I made a vector and I put one. And it will keep doing this for the 95 components. And then I will have it for the 1,000 depths of value and for the 1,000 simulation. And I will have the damage vector. It's called damage vector at the 3D. So DM, I is the simulation, J is the depths, K is the components, right? So this is a 3D vector that has lots of data. So let's see how I calculated the probability of failure. So to calculate the component fragility, what I did is for each component, for each flood depths, and then I start counting the fails. I start with fails, assuming that the component didn't fail. I start with, so what I want to do, I want to trick MATLAB. I want MATLAB to count the fails that happens. So I start with zero and ask MATLAB if the value of the DM is more than zero. Actually, DM is either has zero or one. Zero means that succeed. One means that fails. So if it's more than zero, put one plus one to, to the, fail, the failure count. And it keeps counts for the 1,000 simulation. Once I finish the 1,000, if, for example, it becomes 500. 
So once I end, I divide the number of failures of the total number of simulations to give me the probability of failure of component K at flood depths J. Component K like component number one at flood depths, for example, one meter. This is the fail. But to do this, I have to run 1000 simulations here. So, and then to do this. And then what is the replacement cost of the component? By right? given that this is the probability of failure, let's assume that that let's see, let's see. still have like five minutes. So, for example, I knew the probability of failure of the component. For example, the probability of failure of the component is 50%. And I know that the component costs me $1,000. I told you this concept before. How much I expect a loss if I know that the probability of failure is 50% and the component costs 1000 500. 500. 0.5 multiplied by 1000. That's what I did here. The probability of failure multiplied by the replacement cost. Then here I have, but the thing is, the replacement cost is not a specific number, right? It's a 1000 simulation of the replacement cost. So what I multiply it here, I multiply the whole vector, the 1000 number by the probability of failure. It gives me another vector of 1,000, but what I'm interested in is the mean. mean value. So I get the mean of the replacement cost, rather than having a vector of 1,000, I ask MATLAB, take this 1,000 value, divide them by 1,000, and tell me what is the mean and what is the standard deviation. So I get the mean and the standard deviation of the replacement cost. And this is, this is the unique thing about this function, because if you use has a stage damage function, it just tells you, this is the average losses, but right now we tell you an average with a standard deviation. This is an average, but actually it could be within this range. Okay, we multiply the whole column of the replacement cost by the probability of failure, right? Yeah, the, the whole column, the whole vector. Yeah. Like you have a vector of 1,000 number, yeah. and then you have a constant, which is the so probability of failure. Then you get the, uh, the, 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 the a, one, a vector of 1,000 number the of the replacement cost. Yeah. And then I take the mean. I come from the beginning, not do the simulations and multiply the mean of the replacement cost by the probability of failure there. But what, what do you mean by the. Uh, like I, I used the, the mean of the, of the replacement cost and generated the whole column. Oh, and then you I mean the mean, mean that we have? Yeah, like we don't have. Yeah, you can do that. Right. But I will use them alone because the, I, I did. I developed the three approaches or two approaches. This is one of the approaches. Next time I'll show you another approach that I did. The replacement cost wins. Okay, so let's get here. Yeah, let's see the plotting. How, when we plot this, will be look like? Let's go to. So we did this for all the components, right? So what I did here, I plot. Okay. So right now, I have the probability of failure for each component at each. This is case component at each of flood depths, right? So right now I can plot what is the probability of failure of a specific component at each flood depths, like here, number two. So you have here 0.10%, 20%, 50%, till 100%. And I did this for all the components. So what I'm doing here, I'm asking MATLAB, plot me. I have one single flood depth vector, but I have the probability of failure for each component across this depths. And I'm asking MATLAB to plot them all. So if I showed you the curve, it will be something like this. Get it down. So this is the 95 components, and this is the fragility curves for all the components, right? So for example, this curve, so I, I have the probability of failure and there's seven meter, eight meter, nine meter, but actually I have at 7.01.02 because I have 1,000 value. And then what my lab did, it just like make a line beneath this. So I need you, can you see there is lots of components stacked together here? And there is lots of components stacked together here. You just like want to imagine why do you have all these curves like here at one meter? And one, what all of them here are like around four or five meters? Just think about it. First floor, and then second. Yeah. What happened in first floor? There's a lot of components yeah. are damageable because I have a ground space foundation and there's lots of components are damageable here, like the fridge, the stool, the dryer, the washer, the TV, lots of components here. And then from 
The first floor to the second floor, just the two components that get damaged gradually, like the drywall, things like electrical socket here, until you reach to the second floor and you get a stack of components like bedrooms, bathrooms, like you have, also you have TVs, you have closet, you have lots of things. Here. So that's why you have a stack of components here. And then when you get to the end, here we, where we have the structural components like the roof, this is the black one is definitely the roof. So you have a roof here. So you will have maybe the roof sheeting, the roof flooring, like the roof covering and everything here. So this is a little bit reasonable explanation of how these fragility look like. And actually we'll find that there's some components that are vertical. What does it mean if the fragility curve is like a vertical line? Once it get, doesn't get down gradually. That means like, and all right, that's a good explanation, but actually there is a strong word. That means it's almost deterministic. There is no much uncertainties in the probability curve. Once it hit water, it's so it's one number. So that's what, what most of the appliances is, just like almost going vertical. But there is some components that there is some uncertainties. So it's over depth, it can't get damaged. So this is some kind of, it's a, when I presented, this and to my, when I'm my second year of my PhD or something, this is most of the questions. Why this is vertical? Why there is lots of components here? Why is there lots? Of, so when you develop something, you need to know everything about it. Why this came like this? Why this came like that? Right? So we are uh, hit the 145. So we stopped here at line maybe uh, 75. Next time we will, uh, next, like after 10 days or something, we will continue this. We have our midterm next week. We don't have a class on Monday. We will be using two hours on Wednesday for the exam. The exam will start at 12.30 until 2.30. 2 uh, exam will be on Canvas. Try to be there maybe five minutes. Make sure that you're well connected. You're in a quiet area. And be by yourself. Like the, this is not a group exam. You will have to be on your own. You will have to take your exam on your own. Everyone will have a different exam. There is no time. To check a message with something else so i'm allocating two hours so it's two hours it will definitely will take two hours okay so just uh do it yourself right uh, does anyone have any question all right so see you guys uh after the exam